So uh, welcome everyone to our Buy Corona webinar series. Uh, today we have Shiresh Sharkande, the fully digital workflow for dental sleep medicine. It's gonna be a, a real treat, it always is when Shiresh speaks. Uh, but before we, uh, we, we get into the talk, I'd like to just review a little bit of housekeeping. Start off, I'd like to thank our many sponsors, uh, not only for them um, helping to support our programs, but for what they do in our industry. The appliances that they continue to refine and upgrade and improve, the, the technologies that they work on and they bring to the table that allow us to do the jobs we do for our patients. Without them, we, there wouldn't be dental sleep medicine. And the, they play a huge role in, in advancing things and listening to our feedback and improving the products we use. And I'm very thankful for everything they do. So I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge them. And we have one more on the books, anterior midpoint of scooting stops with uh, Don Malaysia, May 12th. But we are going to be announcing uh, a few more coming up. The idea of these Buy Corona webinars series was basically to, you know, something for us to do while we're stuck at home. You know, slowly people are going to be going back to work now. So we're going to uh, maybe perhaps do a different format, different time of the day. But uh, we'll keep you informed about that. There's also the Dental Sleep Medicine Speakeasy, our little uh, evidence-based online discussion group, BYOB, on Wednesday afternoons from three to five. And um, yesterday, or the other day on Wednesday, we went to about a quarter to six, and most of the people stayed on right till the very end. That's how much they were enjoying the conversation. So it, it really is a lot of fun if you're really into dental sleep medicine, and if you're not, you really need a lot of booze to get to it. So a little bit of housekeeping, uh, audio options, pick computer or phone, follow the instructions, post your questions below, and, and if you want to make this panel go away, you can press this little red arrow, and if you want to raise your hand to get the, the uh, Elaine's uh, attention so that uh, she can uh, chat with you, uh, you can do that. And of course, your CE certificates will be emailed to you uh, two, three days uh, down the road. If you are looking for AGD qualifying CE, please make sure that you give me your numbers. We need your license number, we need your AGD number. And uh, that was either entered when you registered or at the end, when you're, there's a couple questions to answer. Answer the questions, please, and, and just provide that information. Okay. So the fully digital workflow for dental sleep medicine, Dr. Shiresh Sharkadeh. Well, you know, uh, this gentleman at this point, such a young guy, really doesn't need uh, an introduction. He speaks internationally. When I say internationally, I mean worldwide. And uh, I would say he's probably, he is uh, the, the foremost authority with the digital workflow. Um, he lives and works his talk. He walks his talk. And so when he's speaking, he's speaking from his own personal experience, uh, the digital workflow right from A to Z. And so it really is a meaningful discussion. Now, you may buy into everything he says or not everything he says. I'll do this, do that. That's your choice. We're all our own clinicians. But with regards to being the authority on this subject, I really can't think of anybody else that could step into these shoes. So um, you, know, you can see, you could read below there all the all, uh, his accolades. That there's actually more than that, but uh, the, the screen was full. Bottom line is, um, with great uh, pleasure, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Shiresh Sharkandey. So thankful that he's here today. Thank you, John. Thank you, John, for the kind introduction. It's, uh, it's uh, glad to be here. Uh, glad to be on a great talk. You've been doing a lot of great things the past month. Uh, I know how much effort and work goes into these things. Uh, thanks to both you and Elaine for setting these all these different uh, initiatives up. And I'm glad I could be part of this and contribute uh, to a great friend and a great leader in the industry yourself. Thank you. So you have control of the screen? Okay. Go to it. 
Yeah. So what we should do is just go straight right to the presentation. I think we are good. Everybody should be able to see me now. And I'm going to make sure this is centered right in the middle as well, so we are good to go. Well, uh, I want to also welcome all the attendees. Uh, I know uh, we're all uh, kind of busy these days. Everybody thinks that we may not be as busy, but we are. And I'm still sure that you have you can have way better things to do, even if it's a matter of sitting at home and enjoying time with your loved ones. But you're here, so thanks for giving us your time. Uh, so I'm going to try to make this uh, useful for you. We're going to be talking for about I would say half an hour, 45 minutes. Is that fine, John? And then we can get into some Q&A after that. Absolutely. Uh, it's much better usually when you get to the questions. I try to be respectful of everybody's time and try to finish on time, but I will be available after as long as possible, as long as there's questions. All right. So if we are ready to go ahead, um, let me just go through some of the initial introduction slides, as we said. And these are some of my affiliations, just mostly more as a matter of uh, explaining my conflict of interest. Uh, but my main conflicts of interest, I always like to start with that one so everybody knows who I am and what I do. Uh, there's going to be a few slides that I will be talking about, a technology called Matrix Plus, which I believe some of you have heard about it already from our chief medical officer perhaps a few weeks ago. Did John talk about the um, Matrix as well in his talk? I'm assuming he did, right? He did, yes. Perfect. So. I am the Chief General Officer with Zephyr Sleep Technologies, and I am a shareholder at the company. I'm also the Clinical Director at the Snore Center, which is a multidisciplinary sleep clinic here in Alberta. Uh, also a committee member with a few different sleep committees here in Alberta, including the Dental Association and the Alberta Health Services and College of Physicians and Surgeons of Alberta. I don't think there is any conflict on this presentation, and I will be referring to some of our work that we have done in the past. I have one of them listed, but there's quite a bit of them there. Uh, I do also get uh, financial sponsorship from uh, some of the companies that you see there, Orem Group, or Somnus, Nierman, Sinclair, Zephyr, Dance Twice, Rona, Dental Corp, and Hytera. So you know everything about me now. You know what to believe and you know what not to believe. Uh, but if you have any other questions, my uh, name happens to be here. Most of you are following me here. Let's just move forward. Let's just get right to the real stuff. That's why people are here. Uh, we're talking about digital. Why are we talking about digital? We live in a world that everything happens to be digital today. Uh, literally everything is at our fingertip, including this little phone. We used to say things are at our fingertip, but this means literally. It's not a figurative thing. You want to catch a ride, you go on your Uber and you get a ride. Uh, you want to do your groceries. And about six months ago when I used to give this presentation, everybody said, no, I still go to the grocery store. But today, we're all doing it online. And I feel like this is going to be, in a way, a paradigm shift, almost a catalyst to the changes that were inevitable. And now with this whole COVID situation, we're probably going to see an expedition of this fast changes. You want to check for something, you want to get information, we don't go to the library and open books anymore. We go on Google. We, even our patients, when they want to get some information, they go and they check with Dr. Google and they come to us <laughs> with their information. So we live in a digital world, whether we like it or not, and it is about to change our life drastically. And it's not about just replacing what we do today um, non-digital uh, or animal. It's actually going to change a lot of things around it. For instance, um, I was at a talk with Peter Hernandez. He's a very well-known speaker, the founder of XPRIZE Foundation. And he was talking about how a uh, car, like ownership of car, can become obsolete in a few years with these new methods of ride sharing, perhaps Uber, perhaps even air taxis, which are available right now. And then he went one step further than that. And the answer is, what happens if we don't own a car? That's what a lot of people don't think about. It's not about just replacing the car. It's about what the influence of replacing the car is going to be. Well, if we don't own cars, do we need roads the same way as we do today? Do we have to have a garage in our houses? And the impact of stuff has like this little bit of dominoes. And this is not something that is limited to let's say the technology and non-dental sector. Healthcare is not an exception. The healthcare global digital market is growing. It is a, uh, I believe, close to about 200 billion, 230, $240 billion today. But anyway, in 2016, it was a $180 billion market. And by 2025, it's gonna be around the $536 billion 
Uh, my prediction will be it probably will be bigger with all the stuff that we have to deal with today, including teleindustry and all that. So what is global digital health model? It includes everything that we do from the treatment, from the consults, from the uh, softwares and everything that we use in our clinics, from the intraoral scanners and everything else, they all fall under global digital health market. So it is an emerging market. It is here. It is inevitable. It is going to happen. So we better be ready for this. Uh, that's what I want to get. Why? Why is it such a hot topic these days? Why digital? You know, uh, Is it just because we're going to replace an alginate, for instance, with an intraoral scanner? No, it goes beyond that. The whole concept of digital and technology is to increase our accuracy and efficiency. That is very, very important. What technology and digital workflow, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit later on. There's a difference between technology and digital work. Technology is the equipment that we use, and workflow is how we put them together and how actually we utilize them in a meaningful series of actions. And it's usually the workflow that makes us more efficient. It's not the technology itself. It's how it's being used individually and within the total system. But in general, technology and digital workflows allows us to be more accurate and allows us to be more efficient. For instance, it allows us to be focusing more on personalized medicine. Uh, the implications of being able to know what treatment works for what patient, uh, the implications of knowing what medication, what pill is going to work for what phenotype of, for instance, hypertensive patients, those are the things that we can use and we can do with technology. Minimizing uncertainties, you know, one of the biggest problems that we have in our health system is actually human errors. That are. I believe I remember in stat that are about 100,000 deaths in U.S. every year that are just a result of human errors, either due to fatigue, lack of sleep, or anything. Computers do not get tired. Technology does not. They will make errors, but it's consistent. So consistency is going to be huge. And efficiency. And what is efficiency really? We talk about efficiency a lot, but efficiency really means three things. One, it's going to allow us to do things faster. It's going to allow us to lower the cost. And it's also going to allow us to increase the quality of care. And that's what exactly technology is going to do for us. And when I talk about the digital workflows, those are the three measures that we want to focus on. How can we increase the speed to treatment? How can we increase quality of care? And how can we lower the cost? And that's one of the challenges that we have. If we want to have a, a therapy that is going to address a huge pandemic called sleep apnea. Today, when we talk about pandemics, we keep talking about COVID, which it has a global, I believe, cases around 3 million or something today, let's say close to 4 million. But when we look at the pandemic of sleep apnea, we have over 1 billion people out. So we need tools that is going to allow us to address this fast, efficient, and we've got to lower the cost so we don't have a lot of issues in terms of access. Uh, also, access to care, which I just noticed is very important. Technology is going to allow us to, that, to do that a lot, including telemedicine and teledentistry. I won't be talking a lot about telemedicine and teledentistry today, uh, just purely mostly for the time sake, but it is very important. And of course, increase better patient experience. So with that in mind, um, every time we talk about technology, the best place to use technology is look at your current workflow models and figure out where are your challenges and utilize those challenges as an opportunity and apply the technology and the digital workflow and the tools that you have exactly to those areas. Because when you look at technology, for instance, when we talk about that, in some cases, anything that we use in our dental practices, including our softwares, including our practice management, including our teledentistry, phone call, these are all called technology. What I'm gonna focus on is gonna be technologies that is gonna allow us to address the challenges that we have in oral appliance therapy today, just to be able to focus this talk to oral appliance therapy. What are some of the challenges that we meet today? Of course, it's inconsistent efficacy. We don't know who the appliance works for consistently. We don't know where to set the mandible. It does take us longer to get patients to that efficacious treatment. We do have side effects. Challenges of conventional models and manufacturing. The old school way of doing uh, PVS. And when I say old school, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying that there are better ways of doing it. And PVS, they're not as accurate. Uh, even with digital impressions, there were challenges in terms of how fast and how easy to use it is 
communication with physicians, for instance. How do we communicate? How do we get our diagnosis? How do we let them know that we're treating? And long-term follow-up, and I can go on and on and on, but these are the top, I would say, nine challenges that I see on a day-to-day -day basis when we are doing all of this. So the question is, how can we use technology to address these challenges and make oral appliance therapy even better than what it is? The question is not whether or not we're good enough today. And the question is, how can we be better? I uh, did talk about that in another webinar a couple weeks ago. And the way I look at oral appliance therapy, it's not about oral appliance therapy, it's about the OSA market. And it's not about CPAP being our competitor. We don't want to be as good as CPAP. We want to be better than CPAP. We want to be the first therapy. And what else comes up with it? Doesn't matter. But today, these are the two that I'm kind of going to be focusing on. And the reason for that is, again, going back, there's 1 billion people today out there that have oral sleep apnea. 80% of them remain undiagnosed. And for us to be able to actually help and make an impact for meaningful impact on the problem, we need easier solutions, we need more dentists involved, and we need the buying of consumers as well. And uh, when I put this slide up, this, generally the face of dentistry is changing today. You know, Consumers are demanding different things. They're not just here to get their teeth fixed. They want to make sure we're up to date with the digital as well. And I feel like this is actually going to get a lot more and faster in the next few years. They're seeing dentistry the same way as they were seeing it 30 years ago. We talked about this with another webinar that I had. It's just they're going to start asking for more. And when they start asking for more, we have to be able to provide. The other reason we need to be a lot more efficient is just the whole market of oral uh, sleep apnea. I used this slide a long time ago, about actually six years ago. You may remember it as John. We did that at a talk at AADSM. If you look at this, I like to call this the jungle of sleep apnea today. Uh, let's assume that the 1 billion people that we talked about lived in this little jungle. The number of people that are actually today diagnosed with a sleep apnea will fit in this little red, orange, whatever color it is, a square ring. And you can see how many other patients are out there that have a sleep apnea and they're not getting any help. That little orange square represents every patient that is being diagnosed, not even patients that are on therapy right total number of people. So there's so many other people that we should be helping. And the little yellow square here, in a sense, represents the number of people that are on oral appliance therapy today, which is less than 10% of the market, actually, depending on where you are. In average, it's about that 8 to 10%. That's what I understand. The numbers are changing, but very gradually. And in that little square, we have all these problems that we talk about in our meetings. Well, uh, some of us are dealing with insurance and the challenges of guidelines and everything. Some of us looks like we're doing a walk in the park. But in a sense, when you're struggling with all this stuff, we tend to miss the forest for the trees. We don't realize there is all these people that are out there that we could be helping. And the key to that is, in my opinion, is to go ahead and start increasing that number. We got to go out. We got to increase awareness. We got to keep on increasing the portion of the pie, not by just simply taking it away from the CPAP, but also actually going out there and finding new people that are in need of a treatment. And for that, it's not going to be me, you, John. It's not going to be 4,000 or 5,000 dentists. We're going to require every general dentist to somehow get involved in this. It doesn't mean that they have to do everything. They have to start recognizing it. And for them to do that, they have to have confidence. It has to be simple. It cannot be complicated. And that's what technology allows us to do. In a sense, if you were going to treat 50% of people that have oral appliance, that, have, that are diagnosed with sleep apnea, what else do we need? It's the whole notion of be careful what we wish for. Are today's protocols, are they good enough if we were to see 10 times more patients? With that being said, I'm just going to get right into it. I think it's important to understand why we talk digital before we start talking digital. Because you may look at this and you may say, well, you know what, my workflows are working just fine today. And that is exactly what's going to drive us down. We're not going to, we shouldn't be thinking about today. We should be thinking about five years from now or two years from now. Um, there is a lot of technologies that uh, are out there. I'm going to focus on three main technologies that I like to think about it as the, uh, the minimum that you need to get in the digital world of dentistry and sleep in a sense. I look at intraoral scanners, and I look at CBCT as the access to the world of digital dentistry. There is a lot more stuff that you can add in terms of digital milling and all that. But these two, in a sense, these are the minimum you need. And if you want to get into sleep 
In my opinion, of course, the uh, matrix plus would be the minimum. So these three components, if you have those three components, you'll be able to put a very efficient, very effective, fully digital workflow in your clinic, perhaps as of Monday. It's not that complicated, it's just you gotta put it together. Let's start with intraoral scanners. It's one of the things that uh, we use in our clinic right away. Uh, we've been using intraoral scanners since 2006, I believe. Uh, this was the first one we started using was an iTero. For those of you who had an iTero before, you remember it was not a movie like, it was an actual uh, click of a button. You had a green button and you had a pink button and you had to press it with your foot and it would take an occlusal photo, a mesial photo, and distal and lingual photo of your actual prep and then you would stitch them all together. Uh, this is back in 2006, 2007, and we were one of the first uh, offices in. Uh, Canada that had it, and I used to do even my full mouth cases. So for those of you who are wondering whether or not these technologies are accurate, they were accurate 15 years ago, never mind today. They came, of course, a long way. They're a lot more efficient, they're a lot easier. Uh, I put a picture of a few of them. Uh, we worked with all these different technologies, including uh, Prime Scan from Densply Serona, Trios, um, Itero, uh, CareStream. And I like to kind of look at these four or five as the top four or five. And they all have their pros and cons, but overall, they are accurate in terms of getting the proper arch integrity. And that's one of the main important questions for oral appliance therapy. Are they accurate not only in terms of the tooth, but actually are they going to be able to capture the arch? Why do we like it? One, number one, it allows us to create a digital workflow. It's not just the technology that we're adding onto a clinic. But in general, it does help reduce patient discomfort. These are all based on different studies that was done. They are more time efficient. Maybe at the beginning when you get there, you may feel like, well, it's taking you more time to do a scan than it is to do an alginate. Reality is when you get good at it, it shouldn't take you more than a minute to two to scan each arch. Uh, our average time is about two and a half minutes for a full mouth scan. And if something is missing, you go back and you delete it. They are more time efficient and they are very accurate, both in terms of capturing the actual details of the teeth we're talking about a sleep today, so I'm not going to talk about the actual prep. I'm just talking about the arch form. Uh, and they're accurate enough for custom-made devices. So that's the first technology we use. It allows us to have, use it as a patient communication tool a lot. I will get that to that as well. I do have a slide that I will talk about later. Uh, we go beyond just replacing our impressions with a digital impression. We actually use it to explain the technology and explain the actual workflow and explain the treatment to our very, very important. So what are the things that you may want to keep in mind when you're looking at these scanners? Uh, the size of the scanner does matter. Does it mean that the smaller it gets, the better it is? Uh, just you got to start working with your team and see which one they're more comfortable with. Uh, does the system use powder for scanning or not? Most of the systems today don't use powder anymore. They're most of a video capture. Um, can the scan be used for the cases that we want, especially for sleep? Again, most of them can but you'll be surprised some of them are not as uh, good. Most importantly, what kind of training and support is available? Uh, you want to kind of keep an eye on that one, whichever company that you decide to go with, make sure it's in a scanner that has a good training, good support, and also how well it integrates into the rest of your system. Um, is it an open platform, closed platform? These are the things that you may want to keep in mind and then figure out what fits your client. It's not a one-size-fits-all. you got to figure out what fits your digital workflow best. Uh, the second technology that we use is uh, 3D, CBCTs. We like to call it uh, 3D imaging in our clinic. That's one of the reasons. The, one of the reasons we do that, the moment you say CBCT, uh, the first thing that the patient's mind goes towards is uh, the CT that they had for chest or anything like that. And they're like, oh, I'm going to get irradiated and I'm going to get burned. I'm going to get cancer out of this. And we all know the level of radiation between a chest CT and a CBCT that we do on our clinics is tremendously different. And it's a lot lower, especially now most of these technologies, most of these uh, equipments do have a low dose capability which allows us to bring that dosage down. That's why we use the term 3D imaging, which allows us to actually show it to the patient. Patient communication is very, very important. What do we use our uh, 3D imaging for? Um, I do have a picture of the area on the top left. I'm gonna come back to that uh, because that is one of the very hot topics, but not so hot topics in sleep, and I wanna make sure I'm clear on that. 
But before we get into the airway segmentation and volumetric analysis, there's a lot of other things that lead to a CBCT. Number one is actually patient communication. Every CBCT that we take in our clinic, we go through it with our patient. Also, we send it for a radiologist to give us a report. We don't just capture it. It's very important to sit down with the patient after and show them a 3D image of their whole head and skull. You took it, may as well utilize it. And we utilize that to create value for our patients. We're utilizing it prior to getting into the treatment. We start checking the nasal airway. One of the things that we always look at is the septum, the soft tissue. Here we have a patient that you can take a look on the right uh, sinus. There is some sort of a fluid buildup. Uh, there is a deviated septum. It doesn't mean that they're not capable of breathing, but it is a sign. It is a red flag for us to look further into. We also look at the TMD, both in the centric position and if we have the final position, where are we going to be taking the bite registration, which we'll know that with utilization of Matrix Plus, and we want to see where that condyle is going to be located at. Do we have any concerns? We're starting to learn a lot about that stuff, exactly what it means, the position of condyle with respect to the articular eminence, and also if there is any degenerative changes, any bone changes in advance. The last thing you want to do is ignore these pre-existing conditions and get into the treatment to just let your patient know three, three months down the road that now they're having TMJ issues, but it's not because of your appliance, but because they had it before. Well, sorry, doctor, you didn't tell me that. We utilize that a lot. There is a lot more. We also look at the jaw position, bone position, asymmetries, and we're learning, as I said, a lot more in terms of yaw pitch roll of the mandible, maxilla, yaw pitch roll of the maxilla as well. And we take a look at that as well. In an initial phase, I would say just get used to looking at the nasal airway, get used to going through the coronal, sagittal, and axial view as well, and do that in front of the patient. The patients absolutely love this when they look at it. They're realizing, well, you're looking at more than just my airway. You're not trying to give me just a little piece of acrylic. But the other thing that we utilize this a lot is for what I like to call it visualization of the treatment. Of course, you can use CBCTs. There are some studies to show you whether or not a patient is at risk of having sleep apnea based on their anatomical traits. We do know that if the minimum cross-sectional area in a CBCT that's even sitting up is less than 50 millimeters square, that means that the patient has a higher risk of having airway disorders and sleep problems. But we don't use that a lot for that side of it because there's simpler questionnaires like Stop Bang, Berlin questionnaires that we can use that. If we see it as part of our routine exam, great, we'll look at it. But what we do utilize it for is just to show the patient what their airway looks like, what does it mean that your airway is collapsing, and how could an appliance change your airway size. We're not using it for prediction. I want to be very, very clear. There is no data as of today. It may change in the future to be able to predict the outcome of oral appliance therapy with airway visualization. That, that's not possible as of today. Uh, however, it's a great tool for patient communication and treatment cases, uh, treatment acceptance. Uh, the other thing that you want to keep in mind, some of you may be wondering why, I don't want to get into a lot of details, but because anatomy is just one part of the whole reasons that a person can have a sleep apnea right? There's so many other reasons. There's so many other variables that can cause that. That's why we have different phenotypes of sleep apnea patients, things such as your loop gain, your arousal index, your lung volume, many, many, many more things that can make a patient at risk of having sleep apnea. In a sense, anatomy is a part of a system that can create airway issues at nighttime. And of course, the other main reason is our airway between daytime and nighttime completely behave differently. We all know that already. What the way your airway and your pharyngeal dilator muscles work while you're awake, it's completely different because we have neuromuscular compensation to keep our airway open uh, in response to that negative luminal pressure. But when we go to sleep, when we go to REM sleep, the behavior is completely different. So use it with a grain of salt. I really focus on hard and soft tissue examination of the patient and finding any red flags, whether or not my appliance can exaggerate those pre-existing conditions. And I use it a lot as a, as I said, patient communication tool. That's a slide that I put up in a lot of my presentation. A good diagnosis and treatment plan will remain only a plan unless the patient decides to go ahead. Sometimes as clinicians, we're guilty of thinking, well, I explained everything perfectly to my patients. 
and logically, but they didn't go ahead with treatment. What's wrong with it? Well, there is one big thing that you forgot. Humans, we make emotional decisions and we justify it by logic. Just because something really makes sense logically, it doesn't mean that we're going to do that. That's just perfectly proven in the past. We know that in every different aspect, and medicine is exactly the same. So we got to start talking the patient's language. And what's the patient's language? They want to see. Visual aids are very, very important. They want to see what does it mean that your airway is collapsing. Of course, you and I, John, can see this and be like, oh, I can understand how my airway is collapsing. But the patient doesn't see it. And this allows us to show them exactly what it looks like and what is the mean, the choking point, and the collapsing. It is the treatment that makes the patient better, not the treatment plan. So for me, the value of taking a CBCT at a low dose to be able to convince and guide a patient towards the right treatment is way above and beyond the clinical benefits of that as well. It's very, very important to keep that in mind as well. The other thing that we do use our CBCTs for are part of digital workflow. Uh, it's not necessary for all appliances and all devices, but now there are devices that we would be able to uh, overlay our what are called the optical impression files, STL or whatever style they are, on top of the 3D imaging files, which could be DICOM or other versions. And from this image alone, you'll be able to press a button and all the files are going to be in the hands of manufacturers and within about a week or two, you can have your appliance back. And now you're actually precisely translating that position, which is going to create a more comfortable appliance at the end. This software that we're using, it's the CCAT Air software, and which is an open platform software, but there is a lot we do. What are the things that we want to keep an eye on when we're using CBCTs? Uh, the voxel size and the focal spot size. Voxel is think about it as a pixel in three dimensional. Field of view, we like to use a field of view that captures both the joint and everything else at the same time. Uh, I know some provinces and some states, they may have different restrictions, but those are the things that you want to pay attention to. Radiation dosage, exposure time, capture time, uh, degree of rotation, is it a sit-up or is it a stand-up? Of course, again, warranty and services. Uh, how fast is the reconstruction of the images? A lot of these technologies are becoming really, really good that meets that minimum requirement. And it comes down to that training and it comes down to that how it fits within your digital workflow as a system. Uh, the third technology that we use is, of course, Matrix Plus. Uh, we use that a lot for our uh, treatment planning phase. Um, so when we talk about treatment planning, there is many different variables that we took into consideration in terms of our clinical treatment planning. That includes their CBCT 3D imaging file. That includes their dental treatment. That includes patient preference. That includes patient medical comorbidities. And also, whether or not they're actually a responder to our appliances and exactly at what position. These are many, many different factors that we should consider when we start treatment planning patients. Um, I feel like this is going to be the next 10 years of uh, dental sleep medicine, if you ask me. It's going to be how we're going to involve dental sleep medicine as part of general dentistry, but focus on case selection and proper treatment planning and enabling every single dentist to be able to do the simple cases. And simple doesn't necessarily mean just no AHI. Simple means something that fits within that whole picture of the picture. For instance, a young patient that doesn't have any restorative treatment and they respond at a very low level of protrusion, that's a simple case. However, you can have a low AHI of 10, but a patient that requires 20 different restorations with an existing uh, TMJ problem and they have a lot of other comorbidities, that is not a simple case. And how to include that into actual uh, dental treatment. Um, again, I'm not going to go into a lot of depth with about Matrix Plus because I believe John has uh, covered that in the past. We call that feedback control mandibular positioner. It's a test that allows us, gives us two very valuable information. One is, of course, whether or not a patient will respond to mandibular protrusion. And I like to use that terminology as opposed to oral appliance person. When I do my consult with my patients, I'm not going to tell them whether or not they're going to have to respond to an oral appliance. Why? Because there's so many other factors. Are they going to be able to um, tolerate the device? Is it going to fit their teeth? There's other factors. All I'm trying to figure out is here is, am I capable of keeping the pharyngeal airway open at nighttime with mandibular manipulation in a sense, not necessarily just advancement either. And if I'm manipulating the mandibular position, at exactly what position am I capable of 
keeping their area open. And if I know those two information, combined with other information that we're going to get from them from the clinical examination, then I know whether or not they're a candidate for an oral appliance or not. This is not here to replace us as clinicians. This is here to give us two very, very key information. Is mandibular protrusion going to maintain the airway open? And exactly at what position, three-dimensional position? So as you can see, it's a two-night study. Sometimes goes into three nights. The first night, what we call a dynamic night, I might actually have a picture of that. We look at anything between three to 500 different positions, and we're gathering that data through an AI, artificial intelligence machine learning algorithm. And based on that, we'll make a prediction and combine with the second night data, which is more of a static data, and we can tell whether or not a patient will respond to mandibular protrusion. Uh, here's a simple graph of that one. For instance, this patient will respond to mandibular protrusion at about 3.2 millimeters ahead of an edge to edge position, which is about 50% of their target uh, the total range of uh, motion. And we know if we can maintain them at that position, and if they are a candidate for appliance, that means that if their teeth are good, they will respond in that position. We don't need further protrusion. It is giving us a destination. It is giving us a dosage of the medication. Whether or not the patient can tolerate that dosage, a different question. That's why we're clinicians, and it's up to us to decide. As I said, it combines what we call computer-controlled mandibular positioning. It's the movements that are happening throughout the night, these are not pre-programmed movements. These are movements that are in response to patient's physiological uh, data, such as their breathing, such as their oxygen. The machine is monitoring that, and based on different values that we get, we're moving the jaw back and forth. And this is a individualized almost thing for each patient. Then we gather that data, it goes into a machine learning algorithm, and that's how the prediction is coming out. So it's not an static prediction of the actual treatment. It is taking everything. It's a very complex, uh, multivariable um, algorithm that is being used. I believe it takes into consideration over 260 different variables from the studies that we do. And based on that, the prediction is actually made. Uh, this is what it actually looks like, the signal. You can see on the top line how the machine is basically going back and forth throughout the night, testing the patients at different mandibular position throughout the night in response to their physiological signals that we're getting, including flow, oximeter, flow, pulse, side, position, and all of that stuff together. This is the second night, as you can see, has a little bit more in static position, and we'll go from there. What does that allow us to do? Knowing where the final, what is the final dosage, it allows us to shorten the number of visits. Most of our patients, we end up seeing in about one follow-up visit as opposed to three or four, uh, which is the norm in most of conventional workflow models. And another part of it is we are exactly putting the patient at the position that they need, that enough, enough dosage. What do I mean by that one? Here is a graph from our about 300 patients that we've done in our clinical trials. And as you can see, we utilize that 60 to 70% uh, protrusive position as our uh, reference point. This is a point that most other clinicians tends to start their treatment. That's what we used to do. That's what we're taught to do. We use a George H for the patient at 60 or 70%. Well, what we've learned is about half of the patients do not require that much of protrusion. What does that mean? That means that by us starting them at this position, we are over protruding the patients to begin with. What does over protruding mean? It means that means that they may not be able to tolerate the treatment. That means that they may have more side effects. That means that uh, they may actually have more issues with teeth movement and things like that. So in a way, we could be potentially setting up the patient for failure. You've got to keep that in mind all the time. How about the people that require more titration? Well, if you start at 70%, the patient will get the appliance and they're going to go home. And in some cases, yeah, they may be treated right at that position. But in about half of the other cases, 30 40%, they're going to require more. And we've all experienced that in our clinics. And they come back there, some of them are happy. About 50% of them are like, oh, I'm good. You know who 50% they are? These are the 50% that we have here. The over-protruded one are the ones that are treated at 60 the other half, we're like, well, you know what? We're going to slowly titrate you further. But by going slowly, you might be losing the patient's trust and the patient's confidence in therapy. And never mind, sometimes you may not even go to that 90 or 100%. And we may not even want to. If I knew ahead of time my patients need a 100% protrusion and they already have issues with their job, would I want to provide treatment for them? 
in a sense, we want to do all the treatment planning in advance before jumping into it. And again, two components are whether or not they're going to respond and the other one is the physician, but there's a lot of other variables that is going to go into treatment planning as well. And of course, all this data is available cloud-based. You guys have seen that already. But what does it all look like? I started by telling you guys technology is different from work. So I talked about three different technologies. What is this actually going to look like in a real? So what do we do in our clinic? Uh, first of all, we've done a feasibility study back in 2015, I believe, or 2016. I don't remember exactly when it was published. Sometimes around then, that was published in the Journal of Dental Sleep Medicine. Uh, we um, completed, we actually duplicated that study in our follow-up clinical trials. And this is a study we had about five subjects for the future ones. We had about 60 and 80 subjects, and results are very similar. So what we said was, well, let's compare these two arms together. Well, the first arm is going to be the conventional arm with the PVS impression, fully adjustable articulator. So we're doing our best of the best. And we're going to fabricate a precision device, fully milled digitally, which in this case was a prosomnus IA device. And the second arm was a fully digital workflow, which we scanned their teeth. We went ahead, we did the digital bite registration. And with that, we went ahead and sent all the SDL files digitally to prosomnus again. And they've manufactured another device at the same position, identical look. So the patient could not tell the difference. And then we compared the results. We gave the same patients, it was a crossover study, both appliances, and we looked at three things, how much adjustments we had to do to the teeth, how much adjustments we had to do to the bite, and which one was the one that patient liked more. These are three really important things. These are really clinically relevant stuff. How much share time? I mean, post-COVID, we're gonna care about share time a lot. If a patient has to come back five times to get the appliances fixed, that's your chair time. That's five turn your rooms around. So here is the result. This is what we did, as I said, top line. We had the PBS, fully adjustable articulator, digital arm scanning. We did the digital workflow scanning. I'm going to show you. We use the digital bite fork, and we send these um, STL files to the manufacturer. Why did we use the digital bite fork as opposed to a, a normal George gauge, right? Uh, I, I designed this actually bite fork out of necessity. We utilize this because it allows us to try part. If you're only fixturing the bite in the anterior position, it's very possible for the posterior part of the bite to have jaw pitch roll issues, which can create jaw problems. Two, it allows us to scan the actual bite very easily without having a lot of PBS impression material in between the teeth. The little arm here will keep the tongue out of your array of the scanning, which allows the scanning to be a lot faster. You'll see that in one of my slides down the road. And it allows us to actually re- uh, redo the procedure if needs to be done. So even if I'm not at the clinic, my assistant can put this in place and do this scan very, very quickly. Uh, the comparison was eye-opening. Um, in the conventional arm or non-digital arm, we had to do about two out of five adjustments, about 30, 40% adjustments to the actual appliance in terms of putting the teeth. These are very, very minor adjustments, but still it requires us to take a straight hand piece and create aerosol. In a world that we're talking about aerosol, the moment you take that hand piece out, now you're creating aerosol. Where in the digital model, we had to do zero adjustments. I mean that every appliance that we got back, we just literally seated in place. How about in terms of the adjustment, in terms of the appliance coming together? Again, we had some appliance, some adjustments on the non-digital arm, where in the digital arm, again, it was set it and forget it, literally. Again, we don't even have to polish them. And the patient preference, without knowing which one was digital and which one was non-digital, every patient chose the digital appliance, which was eye-opening for us. That means that it was very, very common. So for me, that was the turning point. I've never done an appliance without the, in a conventional manner anymore. Everything that we do is digital, unless we have some really exceptional cases, uh, denture, implant supported, and things like that. And even those. Today, with the digital technology, we can actually capture a lot of those with soft tissue as well. So what does it actually look like in our clinic? What does it mean? A patient comes see me, how do I do my consults? The first appointment that we do, the patient sits down with my uh, team. I'll go in, I say hi, just do a quick introduction. But then we, we have this appointment called the patient digitization. It's the virtualization of the patient. What do we mean by that one? We want to have all my patient data in a digital format. That includes their sleep study, that includes their theranostic data, that includes their CBCT and intraoral photos. 
it is very similar to what any other dental specialist does out there before sitting with the patients and doing a treatment consult. What does an orthodontist do before doing an actual proper treatment consult? Well, we do records. We do diagnostic records. What does a prosthodontist do? We do diagnostic records. What does a periodontist do? Diagnostic records. What are the diagnostic records for perio? Your models, your pictures, also your pocket depth, also your overall periodontal health. The same thing needs to happen for a sleep. We do our models digitally, but we do gather the data. What are the data that we require for our um, consultations for our treatment planning? Your sleep study, whether or not they will respond to mandibular protrusion and their CBCT. So we gather this data, and until this data is not done, I do not do my actual treatment consults with my patients because truly at that point, I'm just talking about what could happen to them, not what actually pertains to them. If you're doing a treatment consult without this data, really what we're talking about is oral appliance therapy. It could work, it could not. We know something about their soft tissue, but it's not personalized. The patient is going to go, well, you don't even have my data. How do you know if this is going to work for me? So we gather all that data so we can have an objective consultation. When I sit down with the patient, this is usually how my consult goes. We have a little video here. We always start with their sleep apnea testing. We'll bring up the sleep testing. I usually always go where the breathing is normal. We show them what a normal breathing happens to look like so they know they can breathe normally throughout the night. Then I go where they're having apneas and hypopneas. Again, we're using visual aids quite a bit. Hey, look at this. You stop breathing for a minute here. Well, Mr. John, looks like you have a sleep apnea and you stop breathing 50 times an hour. Ah, okay. Or maybe we have that information prior to that. Let's see what's going on. My team told me that you have a sleep apnea. Now we at least know for sure you do. But let me take a look at your CBCT and see if we can find anything. And we start looking at their axial, coronal, and sagittal views. Uh, we go back and forth. And what I'm really doing here is, number one, I'm actually examining my patients. We do the TMJ slicing of the um, actual condyle as well. But the other thing that I'm doing, I'm creating value for my patient. Now my patient can actually see, I'm looking at a bunch of objective data that came from them in the world of digital world, and I can personalize my treatment towards them. We do the air volumetric analysis as well right in front of them. We go into volumetric rendering, and this is when the patient is asking you, well, is that my airway? Yes, what does red mean? That's when you start talking about what red means. So right here at this position, you're telling your patient, number one, that you're talking about them, not every other patient, and that's what people want. We just care about ourselves. But uh, in general, now you're visualizing it for them. And then we go into their matrix testing. Well, it looks like we looked at your matrix testing. It looks like you're going to respond, and we're going to put your job about four millimeters more. It takes me about 10 minutes to do this, but all I've done it, I did it with objective data. And in fact, they have a sleep apnea. There is no anatomical problems in terms of perhaps tolerating a device. And we know creating a device will get rid of their obstructions. Are you ready to go ahead with treatment? It's a completely different discussion than what I used to have. We'll make you an appliance. It may or may not work. We'll do our best. We'll know within three months. Now I'm telling them, you have a sleep apnea. We know it's going to work for you when you get it from night one. And I don't see any red flags. It doesn't mean that you're not going to have side effects, but at least there is no pre-existing conditions. It is completely two different way of doing consults. That's what increases. And to be honest, this is precision medicine. I'm talking about the patient. I'm not talking about general oral appliance therapy. From there, usually we go right into scanning. And um, you can see the video on the right side, which shows the scanning. But what else do we use these visual scans for? We do utilize them for monitoring teeth movement. So every year or two, we do another scan. If there is any teeth movement, we'll be able to see them and we'll be able to record it again, having objective data versus having some subjective measurements. We can monitor their recessions or anything else and we utilize that to show that to them and tell them, well, look at this. This is what we're seeing. You're just the messenger at this point. You're seeing data, you're showing it to them. They don't have to trust you. We do utilize that sometimes for bite changes using technologies such as text scans just for figuring out exactly where the jaw is. And in general, if we have minor teeth movement and if they want to correct it, we can go back to what their SDL files used to look like and create an aligner to move their teeth back. Not that we do that every time, 
but if we need to, at least we have what their teeth look like before. We're not moving their teeth into a random position. We know exactly where they start. You can see here, we're doing the bite registration on that side. So the reality is virtualization of the patient, the digitization of the patient is gonna allow us to have a lot more accurate and precise treatment and have a lot higher case acceptance because we're talking about accuracy and precision. And I'm gonna keep on going to those two words because that is what the patients like to hear. They wanna start realizing, well, things are different from what they used to be. And you're gonna see right in the video how easy it is gonna be us for us to scan. Uh, we're gonna have the tripod bite here. It saves you a little bit of material as well. And then we'll go in there, you put the bite in place, and we're gonna put, of course, the camera in the right position. And you can see on the little video here that we're capturing the window and we're gonna start a scanning. And within a matter of less than two seconds, two to three seconds, you're gonna see the bite coming together right that quick. We also do both sides. You can capture the same bite if you have bite registration in between, but it's not as accurate and it's not as fast. So where do we see it going in the next two to three years? Uh, to be honest, uh, when I show these slides, these are the slides that I used to show five years ago. This is not a new presentation. I'm sure you've seen this before, John. We've talked about this before. And I feel like we're slowly going to see people doing more of this today. This was literally five, six years ago. And I feel like within a year or two, this is going to be norm. What is going to be norm? And after that, I am 100% sure we'll be moving towards printing, uh, not specific printers, just in general, having customized design for the customized patients. We did a demo on a talk that I did in 2017, actually, that we scanned a patient on the stage. I gave my talk for two hours. And by the end of it, we had the actual appliance printed and we delivered it on the stage. It was more of a proof of concept, but that's where I see it. It's reducing the time to delivery of the appliance and how fast we can treat these people, which is not a cool thing. It's actually a better treatment. If we can get a patient treated within a matter of two to three days into the efficacious position, isn't that a great thing? And we can do it for cheaper and more accurate. That is what our patients are going to demand. And that's how I believe we can actually beat CPAP as opposed to be just as good as CPAP. If I can see my patient today, do my consultation tomorrow or in two to three days, and if they're ready to go ahead, get an appliance printed within a matter of 24 hours, so within five days, I can have them fully treated. Now we're talking about a treatment that is way better than CPAP because even if they're trying to put a mask on the patient, the compliance is going to be lower. But this way, we can compete with every aspect and be better than CPAP. The key is being better than alternative, not just CPAP. I'm not comparing ourselves. CPAP is a great treatment, and we use it for a lot of our patients. But these are the two that we have. There's a lot of new novel things coming out, like colossal nervous stimulation. We have things that are going to be talking about external stimulations. There's so many different things out there. But today, this is what we have. Four years, things might be better. Your best should change with time. In general, it's about working smarter, not harder. I love this little slide, the little turtle on a little skateboard, uh, and we'll go from there. In summary, this is what I really, really believe in. Um, OSA, Stuckerless sleep apnea, is a complex disease. We cannot simplify it. It is a very, very complex disease with many different phenotypes and many different factors, but it can be managed relatively with simple solutions when you think about it. A little mask, a little piece of acrylic. They're very simple. And the way we have to do a better job is simple, accurate, and predictable workflow solutions are the only way we can have a meaningful impact as a dentist, because otherwise we're just doing a trial and error. And in my opinion, what we've done in the past two decades to simplify therapy, a lot of times tend to compromise the quality of it. What do I mean by that one? If you wanted to provide more care for patients, we have to do that at the risk of treating patients that could have not been treated. Simplifying should not come at the risk of safety. And in my opinion, digital technology and digital workflow is going to allow us to simplify the actual oral appliance therapy, but do it safely. That is very, very important. Simplification, Einstein says, you know, everything needs to be explained in the simplest manner possible, but not simpler. I feel like that's what technology is going to allow us to do. We're going to be able to help a lot of patients. We're going to be able to get a lot of dentists involved. And we're going to be able not only to keep the safety, but also simplify and help more patients.
with that being said, I feel like we have some time for questions. I've been about five minutes over time. So uh, thank you. If you have any questions, let's go through. Yes. Thank you, Suresh. That was fantastic. Thank so, you. Yeah, if, we do have a few questions. Uh, uh, before we get into the questions, I just wanted to mention that it's uh, uh, five to two. So for those people that have another obligation and they do have to leave, no problem. As long as you stick around to answer the couple questions and make sure you leave your AGD number if you have that, and then you'll get your CE certificate. For those that want to stick around, we'll stay on as long as there's some questions and Shiresh is available. Okay, thank you. Okay, Lane. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the first actually is from Mark um, Anton. Oh, he has left. He just had a comment uh, that it's been pretty well demonstrated that volumetric analysis is pretty much invalid. There are studies that actually demonstrate that although some researchers don't want to admit it, but having had his own uh, since 2008, he can very safely say that the airways, soft tissues are too dynamic. The same patient's volume will change radically from one time from one time point to the next without any treatment. Yeah, uh, th thank you for the comment. He's absolutely right. As I mentioned in my slide as well, the, um, I feel like it's a very general thing to say volumetric analysis is invalid. The question is, what is volumetric analysis invalid for? We know the volumetric analysis that is being done, they're actually very accurate in measuring the actual size of the <clears throat> But whether or not they have any meaning in terms of predicting oral appliance therapy, as I mentioned in my talk, it does not have any validation as of today. So we cannot predict treatment outcome by looking at volumetric. However, saying volumetric analysis is invalid, I feel like that's generalization of the tool. Where it's being used, that's very important. We do know when we measure the volume, it is actually quite accurate. But the volume doesn't mean anything in predicting response to oral appliance. So hope that clarifies that. I thought I did try to say that in my slide, but I hope that people did not get that confused. I think my impression, Shiresh, is that you're really using the CBCT as far as the volume goes, more as a patient education tool to help the patient understand, um, you, know, uh, the, you know, the airway with the appliance in, the jaw advanced versus not, or, you know, or or the potential for the airway becoming larger, but you're not really using it to prove that uh, an oral appliance would work or as um, a proof of concept for the patient. You see, your, your, your appliance will work because look at the airway looks so much bigger here. You're not saying that. No, we don't do that. We don't. And if that came across in my presentation, I'm going to take it back, but that's not what I said. I saw it all. Right. It's not yeah. what you said. Yeah. yeah. It is not what we use for prediction. We have matrix plus for that. But we do utilize CBCT a lot for many other things. We've got to look beyond the volumetric, as I said. TMJ, joint, jaw muscles, nasal, airway, sinuses, so many other things. So many other things. There's a lot of values in 3D imaging. One of them happens to be the patient. Thank you. The next one is from Lane Martin. Um, he wants to know where can you get the di digital bite fork and what uh, protrusive mechanism are you using? Uh, George Gage, Andra uh, Gage, uh, etc. Uh, the, the bite fork, I believe, uh, I know it's available through Zephyr as well, Zephyr Sleep Technologies. If you go on their website, they send, they sell them. There are their rubber ones, the plastic ones, so they don't break. Uh, Prosomus also sells them as well. Uh, just make sure you specifically ask uh, for the ones that I use. Uh, they're called digital bite forks. You can on it, it's not a big deal. Um, it is compatible, it fits into a George cage. So if you have a normal George cage, you can fit it to your George cage and it, it, the zero would be your edge to edge position. Uh, where do I set the mandible? That's the data that I get from my matrix plus. The matrix plus is gonna tell me exactly at what protrusive position, plus one, minus one, minus two, to set the mandible. Thank you, and that was uh, Stephen Millman's question as well. Uh, then we have uh, uh, no, uh, Misha de Mayor. We cannot uh, uh, unmute the attendees. So any questions have to go through the chat. I'm sorry. Oh, 
Mish, Mish is a great friend of mine uh, from uh, Belgium. Hi, Mish. Thanks for being online. If there's anything first of all, you can always call me. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Um, how to uh, and then we have a question from Kavita Narla saying how to correct occlusal changes. I have noticed a patient wearing a an appliance has no posterior contacts. After wearing it for three months, appliance was done by MD. All right. Uh, John, do you want to take a shot at that one as well? We got, we got an expert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, open the back after a few months of wear, clearly the, the jaw is probably yeah. a bit forward and not going back to habitual position. So going over some jaw stretching exercises with the patient in the morning, um, you know, that's the whole point of using the uh, morning bite jig or AM aligner or whatever term you want to use to have them um, stretch things out gently in the morning and then uh, ensure that they're actually re recovering their baseline bite. But nevertheless, in spite of doing all of that, sometimes you're going to get that happening. Um, and, you know, one of the things, of course, is patient compliance. Not everybody will be doing that um, every morning. And then one more caveat is the fact that if people are too aggressive doing that, sometimes it's going to lead to discomforts. And then they'll complain that the appliance is hurting them. So they have to make sure they're not injuring themselves in the morning, trying too hard to reclaim their bite. And want to add anything, Suresh? That's exactly what it is. Just uh, uh, to me, informed consent is the best thing. I'm going to take a step back. Hopefully, patient knew that this could happen. Um, proper treatment planning. Uh, again, I'm going to talk about what perhaps could have been done to prevent, minimize the risk of it happening. You can never prevent it because it is going to happen. And in some cases, it's not necessarily our fault. It's just because their initial anatomy and perhaps some internal joint problems was there to begin with. So informed consent to begin with. Letting the patient know these things can happen, letting the patient know that we are going to do our best to minimize the chance of it happening and also minimize the effects of it, the true effects of it. Posterior open bite on its own, it's not necessarily a bad problem. It never killed any patients. The adverse effect that comes from it, which includes um, having perhaps periodontal issues, having perhaps uh, chipping up the teeth, having headaches and TMJ problems, and not everybody is going to develop those signs just because the back teeth are not touching. I know a good friend of ours talks about that a lot, Barry Glassman, uh, John, of course. Yeah. And not every posterior open bite has to be fixed because that could alone can cause more issues in terms of compressing the retrodiscal tissue and creating more pain. The question, again, it's going to be, what does it mean? What are the benefits and what are the risks? And if you choose to go ahead and give them the exercises, John, you explained it before. Morning exercises, morning repositioners, uh, we do a lot of, uh, we don't do a lot of, to be honest, morning repositioners, we do a lot of the uh, chew bite exercise. It's a bilateral compression of the muscles to get that retrodiscal fluid out of there and hopefully minimize the chance. Thank you. The next one is from Martin Basture. Uh, which scanner would you consider the best, the very best scanner for oral plant therapy? Which one is the best scanner for oral appliance therapy? In the same way that there is a, no best appliance for patients, there is no best scan. It really depends on uh, your clinic, your practice. Uh, are you limited to sleep? Are you not? Are you doing ortho? Are you not? Are you doing restorative? Are you not? Uh, what other um, digital technologies you have in your office? Right? And how is your scanner going to talk to those? Is it open platform or not? Uh, if you have a 3D, is it something that communicates seamlessly or not? Uh, so those are the variables that you want to think about, what's available in Emuria and what kind of support. But overall, the top four or five that I talked about briefly, including Itero, including PrimeScan, including CareStream, including Trios, these are the ones that uh, I've tested and I work with and I like them and I know they work. Uh, I've heard people that are using other, what I love to call them, budget scanners as well, uh, such as Medit, such as other ones that are just black and white for sleep only, and I'm hearing really good results with them. It's not the scanner itself, uh, it's how you use it, but there, I do believe there is a lower level because you want to use a scanner that has a good arch integrity accuracy. 
right? There's a lot of scanners out there that are very cheap that I can do their preps perfectly. So if you're just a general dentist for that, you may not need to invest depending on how much you want to invest anything between $15,000 to $50,000. So uh, I hope that answered the question. What we use in our clinic, as I said, yeah, we use all those top four. I've had the luxury of being able to play around with all of them and validate the visual work. But if you're doing sleep, you may not need all those accuracies on the margins. I don't know. Thank you. So next, uh, we have Mohammed Zafar Zadeh. Uh, thanks for your nice presentation using machine learning needs. Lots of data. Uh, he is curious to know how to, how many data points you use to build a model. So uh, the exact data point I gotta ask our engineers, but how many data points we use in our forest algorithm? We use 266 binary variables on that one. And that's what we use in our random forest. It is in our published paper uh, and their feedback control manipulative position that we publish in the general sleep. Uh, but if you need more information, more intact ones, I will be more than happy to put you in touch with our engineer. Great. So Mish, the mayor is back. Uh, when the Zephyr prediction system is available, when is the Zephyr prediction system <laughs> available in Europe? <laughs> Uh, that's a million dollar question. Um, hopefully as soon as possible. That uh, that, that goes to uh, our board and our CEO, Paul Cataffer, to decide on that one, but uh, hopefully soon. Hopefully soon. Okay. Um, the next one is from Pablo Valiente. Do you think that in the future, the use of artificial intelligence will be able to diagnose a patient with OSA without a polyson grip? Uh, or will require less, less complex sleep study? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, it's not even that long of a future from now. There is a lot of new technologies and wearables. As I said, I didn't talk about all the technologies. I just want to talk about uh, the basics, the minimum basic. I like to call, I like to say, I like to talk to the lowest common denominator. Those are the few things that you need to get into it as a digital sleep medicine. Uh, but the amount of technology and digital things that are coming in the market is just unbelievable, uh, the di especially in the diagnostic and awareness side. I really believe the diagnosis is going to be done based on this little watch or little ring that we're going to have on our hand. Uh, the artificial intelligence in terms of them being able to record your breathing and the effort and respiratory efforts and all that is unbelievable. So many good things coming down the road. Uh, so I don't think the diagnosis portion is going to be an issue which is exactly why we have to focus on efficiency of providing therapy. Diagnosis is only as good if we can actually go ahead and help these people. Otherwise, if we're diagnosing millions and millions and hundreds of millions of patients and we don't have therapies that are simple enough and accurate enough to keep up with that level of demand, we are going to be in trouble. It's like opening that can of worm that you didn't know what to do with. So is it going to be changing? Yes, the diagnosis is going to be completely different from what we see today. And we've already seen that in the past 10 years, how the level threes are getting smaller and smaller. But I think the biometric data that we're getting, um, you know, uh, very soon, uh, I'm going to be a father. I'm happy to announce that. But uh, we were looking at little uh, baby cameras now, the reason I said that. And there are so many of these cool baby cameras with no radiation, with no wearables or anything right now that can tell you how fast your, pay, your kid is breathing and whether or not they're not breathing and quickly actually give you signal. And they're very, very accurate. And if we can do that in a little baby, it's very simple to do that in house. So the technology is there. It's just a matter of applying it. And I think it will be very, very soon before we see that without having any wearables in the diagnosis process. Wow. That's great. Mish, the mayor is back. Um, a nice input is a wake and a call to see, to see the, up, the upper airway. Sorry, can you repeat that question again? I'm not, I think that it's not a question, it's, it's a comment from uh, Mish. Uh, a nice input is a, an, an awake endoscopy to see the upper airway. Yes, yeah, so mm -hmm. as I said, when the patient is awake, the pharyngeal or pharyngeal airway behaves completely differently because it is under the influence of the uh, neurocompensation that we have to keep the airway open. Uh, there, there is a lot, there is a lot that it just doesn't fit in our time. 
And back to the technology, the other side that I feel that it can be used a lot is patients with upper airway resistance syndrome and inspiratory flow limitation and snoring, right? That is going to be another big market of how do we deal with the snoring because we all know snoring is part of the continuum of the disease. And we, we better be ready for this. Let's just put it this way. Artificial intelligence, technology in terms of wearables and where the market is going, it's going to be very, very exciting times. It's not a scary time. It's exciting. <laughs> Dr. V, you wanted to add something? No, no. Dr. V, did no. you want to add something? I thought you wanted no, no, to add a no, comment. I'm no, good. Okay. I'm good. okay, so moving moving along, um, Rashmi Parmar um, is asking, when do you see the matrix plus being cost effectively used for efficacious position by all providers? Um, had a hard time to be able to have Leap physicians buy into it. Okay, that, that's wow. Thank you, Rash. That's that's a big question. And yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to answer it from two different components. Like I'm gonna look at it from two different perspectives. When is it gonna be available for everybody to buy it and all that? That's a different question, right? And I look at uh, intraoral scanners when Invisalign came out. They were at around that. I don't know. 30,000, and I don't think the price has gone down by much. We're kind of ranging in that 20 to $40,000. Uh, so the price of technology, because there's a lot of work that goes into these things, a lot of research and a lot of expenditure up front, I don't know. That I don't know, and I don't want to answer that. It may go down, it may not. That's, as I said, that's the board and everybody else that decides. I can talk as a dentist and how uh, we utilize it, because we have about five matrix pluses in our clinic. And just for everybody to know, we did pay for them, so we did not get them for free, and I still pay for them, just like any other clinician. Uh, so I know the cost, I don't want to call it even the cost barrier, uh, in a way you, I look at it is you cannot afford not having it. Let me explain this to you in a different way. Today, when we look at 100 patients that we, as a dentist, we go ahead and we diagnose 100 patients with a sleep apnea. Out of those 100 patients, because we're not using technology, how many of them actually get recommended an oral appliance? Eight to 10 of them in a good market. 10% of the patients, five to 10% of the patients that are diagnosed with sleep apnea get recommended an oral appliance. Then they come back to you and we make appliance for all 10 of those. And out of those 10, only seven of them are gonna respond or eight of them. And there's going to be two that you've got to keep on bringing them back and losing money on the chair time and follow-ups. But remember, out of those 100, we could have seen 60 of them, or at least 50 of them for oral appliance there. But we only got 10 back. So all the effort and all the time that I've been putting in raising the awareness will result in only 10 appliances. Which, in a sense, it's going to discourage my team. That's what I've learned from general dentists. I'm not talking about the sleep-only practices and the referral-onlys. I'm talking about the big picture. As a dentist, that's going to recognize airway problems in the clinic. We're with Matrix right now, with the same number, the 100 people that I'm diagnosing for a sleep apnea, I can find 50 of them to 60 of them to be suitable candidates for oral appliance therapy. Just to be exact, Matrix Plus, showed that about 70% of patients could respond to mandibular protrusion. I'm saying 50 because I'm assuming 20 of them is gonna remain in that high protrusion that I'm gonna wanna make them. So now I'm making 50 appliances as opposed to 10, right? Let's just put a math right in here. This is, I'm not a number in quality care, which is not a discussion on its own. Uh, I don't like providing things that I really don't 100% believe in my best changes. I did the conventional way for a long time, and I really believe that was the best, right? If I believe something is the best today, I'm not going to let finances get in my way, and I'm going to let that figure out there's realities of the market. But now, even if the finances we care about, 10 appliances, let's say if you use $3,000, that means $30,000 revenue. Where 50 appliances at 3,000, that means $150,000. 150,000 versus $30,000 that right there takes care of my financial problems and financial barrier. For the patient, we charge about whatever you want to charge between two to three hundred dollars for our theranostic matrix plus testing, which will go towards their treatment if they go ahead with treatment, if they are a candidate and if they're actually going to go ahead. 
Why am I willing to give that two, three hundred dollars away? Because I don't have to see them five times. In today's market post-COVID, trust me, chair time is going to become even more valuable. Right? Of course, there's different models. There is Medicare and all that. Some people that pay for follow-ups. That I cannot answer. I'm not an insurance guy. Um, what I can tell you is I never treat my plan based on insurance. This has nothing to do with technology. It has to do with how I practice. I was never taught in dental school or anywhere that insurance was one of the variables that I have to look at in my treatment. So I treat my plan what I truly believe is best based on clinical, medical, dental data. Payment and insurance is very important, but the moment you think that way, you'll be surprised how it changes everything. It's a good friend of mine, Miguel Stanley, uses this, it's finance-based dentistry is killing our industry. We've got to get over that. We've got to start thinking about the value. I'm a firm believer of that one. When you think that way and you present it that way to your patients, they will go ahead. And if they're a non-responder, then they save themselves $3,000. Yeah, you might say, well, that was insurance money. For me, it doesn't matter. It's a money that went to waste. That's our tax money that is going back to the waste for a treatment that they're not going to use. It's another CPAP that is going to be sitting in the room. You know, we talk about 50% of CPAPs being in the closet. We don't want to have 50% of appliances being in the closet in a decade from now because we made all these appliances that the patient didn't wear because we just didn't. So we charge 250, that's how we deal with it. The value for us, we cannot afford not having it because I look at it as losing $100,000 of worth of potential revenue and saving my chair time. But again, that being said, that fits in our workflow. It's not just about Matrix Plus, it's about how it fits in my scanning, my readies, and how we present it and how we treat my plan. That is the difference between getting that case hope that answers the question a little bit. I know that was a long answer, but it's very important. Great. Great answer. And moving along, we have uh, Julio Spagnolo. Will a CBCT for Ontario GP dentists have a large enough area for uh, SICAT air? Yeah, that, that's a good question. As far as I understand, John, you might be the best person to answer that one. I don't believe you can capture both the joint and the airway in one image, uh, which, is, uh, which, uh, which is a challenge. And uh, hopefully we'll see some changes in with the uh, low-dose radiation. I think that's two different views. My understanding is two different views. I don't have a lot of experience with that. but uh, yeah. The field of view you need is bigger than that one, depends on your machine. In Ontario, I believe, in Alberta, we can do it. I know a lot of states you can. Ontario seems to be quite strict. Very strict here, yeah. Mish is back. There's Rush. <laughs> Great <laughs> webinar. <laughs> and uh, wait, there's more. While looking at the upper airway, look at the position of the ep epiglottis. Uh, contradiction for MRA. Um, that's, that's a very deep question, and um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass on that question in terms of what the soft tissue imaging means in terms of indications or contraindications, but as I said, there, are, there is a lot of work that is being done in that area of, um, I like to call it awake imaging, and I wouldn't be surprised if we see some value in it in the next few years, including Again, position and all that, but it is it is a little bit complicated. I know there are some studies in that area, but today for clinicians, we're talking about clinical utilization of these things. I would not focus on that personally. Uh, and he has actually he's back again uh, with a comment. When we follow the webinar, it would be nice to have a certificate for the credit non USA and non Canada dentists, Dr. V. Well, everybody is going to be getting a certificate, yeah. the same yeah. uh, generic certificate with mm -hmm. all of the mm -hmm. information on it. If you're from yeah. a different country and you need something specific, send me an email and let me know what you need and I can modify it for you. Um, the next one is from Rashmi Parmar. Uh, 
Okay, so follow up uh, QI, uh, follow up, oh, okay, follow up uh, question. I know matrix takes protrusion into effect with vertical now becoming an important component to evaluate. Will vertical be part of matrix plot? Um, I like answering questions in different. Uh, John, <laughs> John, jump in this one as well. Uh, but that's what I like about webinars. You get very big questions, which we're supposed to answer in a very small, uh, limited amount of time. Um, let's just start by talking about can you, that's probably what I'm hearing, that's different vertical with matrix plus. That's one of the biggest ones. And the matrix itself does not do vertical adjustments, not live vertical adjustments. However, um, you can test the patients at different verticals by choosing how deep their teeth are going into these temporary trays, or perhaps by adding these little inserts that you can make and not allowing them to go to the four millimeters. The matrix trays are about just about four millimeters away, but if you want to test them at five or six or seven, you can have them at those. So I'm sorry, just for a little clarification, Shresh, are you suggesting putting little stops in the tray to stop yeah. the teeth from sinking all the way down? So exactly. if you put a, a two millimeter stop here and a two millimeter stop there, you said the trays are four, that will give you eight or exactly. whatever whatever dimension you want, you just create little stops, put them in the trays when you're, when you're actually fitting the trays. Exactly, yeah. and the yeah. stops could be little plastic, so it could be actually a little bit of bite registration that sets, and we have done that, and I have done that clinically. But now let's talk about, so technically, you can technically test the patients at different verticals, uh, but let's talk about some of the data that we found in our initial initial studies with Matrix. This is not the Matrix Plus. This is RCMP, not the FCMP, Remotely Controlled Mandibular Positioning. So we looked at a, a group of non-responders that were predicted to be non-responders, and we did look at different verticals. We used the little inserts, and we said, okay, would the prediction of the therapy change if we tested them at different verticals? And what we found back then, this is a few years ago, we didn't find any difference in the prediction of outcome, which means that if they were predicted to be non-responder, by adding more vertical, we did not seem to change the prediction. That being said, we did not make them appliances at different vertical. So there is that little limitation to that uh, kind of a observational study that we've done. But clinically, to me, vertical, and again, that research, I don't need to repeat this, the research on vertical seems to be all over the place. Uh, the few good studies that I do know of in terms of just how it affects the response to oral appliance therapy seems to say anything between four to eight millimeters seems to be okay. If you go more than that eight or 10 millimeters, now you could actually compromise the airway as well. So the effect of vertical overall, systematically over all patients, it doesn't seem to be there as of today. There's not enough data. However, we all know clinically there are times that if you play around with a little vertical, you may make a difference in your snoring or perhaps in your child. We don't know why, we don't know how. How I deal with vertical in my clinic, actually, I look at vertical mostly as an indication and as a factor for where I'm placing my appliance in terms of comfort. To me, vertical has a more important role in making an appliance that is comfortable. An appliance has to work and it has to be comfortable. Those are two, act, two different sides. You can make an appliance that is very efficacious, but it's not comfortable because the patient is overclosed. And you can have an appliance that is very comfortable, but it's not efficacious because the patient is not a respondent. What we like to do in our clinic is just marry them together. So you want an appliance that is efficacious. How do you figure that one out? By knowing the response from the Matrix Plus and all the other stuff. Two, we want it to be comfortable in the joint, which we look at their vertical dimension. So if they're vertically collapsed already, we sometimes add more vertical to put them at the proper vertical dimensions to begin with, which is in that 16 to 21 millimeters. You get these people that they got a CEJ to CEJ measurement of only 11 millimeters. You got to open that, maybe they got the clicking, popping, you want to recapture the disc. So we pay a lot of attention to that. And then we make an appliance there. Otherwise, we try to keep the minimum level of uh, vertical and then when you get the comfort and efficacy both addressed of course it's utilization of the tools to actually get the patient to go ahead with treatment 
And then I'm going to respond to it a different way as well. When we did our matrix plus studies with just simply pushing the mandible back and forth, which is the AP manipulation of the mandible. We predicted about 73% of 70 to 73% of the patients to be responder to oral appliance therapy. This is for all comers with basically ODIs of over 10 and then BMIs of less than 42 or something like that, I believe, so which captures a lot of the people, which is very consistent with the meta-analysis that is out there. So we are not losing a lot of patients due to vertical. Right? If we were predicting, let's say, 20% of patients as responder, then I would be worried. I would be like, well, then we missed a lot of people that we could have had. But we are predicting about 70 to 73% of these people to be responders, responding being defined by ODI of below 10 and 50% abortion. So in short, vertical does matter in oral appliance therapy. Vertical's role in opening the airway, I think we need more research in that area. It doesn't mean vertical is not important in making a good device, but we don't want to generalize in saying vertical has a consistent effect on opening the airway. We don't know that yet. It might, it may not. Uh, but it seems like protrusion alone is going to help us get a lot more people. Right now, we're getting, again, let's focus on how many people we get today, 5 to 10%. If I got 50% of them, I may not have to worry about the vertical patients. Of course, you know, people like John and some of us that are more advanced and, you know, you, your, our practice is limited to sleep and I know hers is as well. Uh, we may have people that oral appliance is their last chance. And in that case, yeah, go ahead and play around with whatever you can. But as a general dentist, I like to focus on people that are the easy, simple case, that I can make them an appliance and they're going to go ahead predictably and get them. Dr. Vee, did you want to add something to that? No, oh, I'm good. Stretch did a good okay. job. <laughs> you look like you're going to say something. Well, Thank I mean, you. You know, there, there's that subset of patients that we can help out with vertical and <laughs> do the sleep yeah. all the time. Uh, know that. And it would really be nice if we could actually get some insights on that from the beginning. What I'll add is this, that uh, I, I use sort of the phenotyping that Dan Lewandowski has, uh, has shed some light on in the literature, and, and uh, even others have, 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 have case studies, nothing, no significant literature on this, and that's the problem. Um, and, and that, you know, for a bigger guy with a bigger tongue, I would tend to go with more vertical to allow more room for this massive tongue. And, and uh, for a more petite lady, I, I, would, I would go with a lower vertical. So, so regardless of um, the position the matrix would put me at, right, I, I would then use the vertical um, when I take my bite, uh, yeah. using that information as well. That's that's what I do. Thank you. For, Thank for you. want of a, a better way to do it, you know. That, yeah, that's that's what, you, you raised a very good point. You raised actually a very good point. So again, let's go back to the clinical dip, uh, technicalities of it. You can test them at different verticals if you wanted to, which we talked about with the insert, and you can take your bite at different verticals. So the only variable of the bite that we use from Matrix Plus is the AP. You right. can still determine where you want to put your patients right. at the different verticals. So right. if they're responder at plus one, you can use a plus one at two millimeter, four millimeter, eight millimeter vertical, right. whatever you need. Yeah. And that's um, what I that's what I choose to do. Uh, like I said, not because that's there's any literature saying that that's the way you should do it, but that's just what I've come up with uh, for want of a of, of a validated uh, you know um, application of that you know you know. And I've seen that in my clinic as well, to be honest. You know, you do make a notice, make a difference sometimes in your snoring and things like that. We just don't know who in advance. So it's more of a second phase of, okay, whether or not if I got rid of it with AP, no, okay, now let's play around. With so years ago, Shiresh, uh, when I first got involved in this at about 96, at that time I was making the silencer appliance. And what was really nice about the silencer is you just change the pin out. You put the four yeah. millimeter pin five, yeah, all the way up to nine millimeter pin. So that's why I like that appliance. I was playing with out, around with vertical back then, yeah. and um, and I found that there would be times where, well, geez, I, I, I he's a, he's advanced as much as he can go. Um, he can't tolerate any further advancement. Let's just try a higher pin. And 
uh, is, is oximetry uh, demonstrated uh, resolution. So then I just built up the pads at the back and, and he, he had a new vertical. So some appliances are easier. Of course, nobody uses a silencer much anymore. Uh, other appliances are tougher to change that vertical. So that's why I like to try and phenotype it up front where if I think somebody would like the, would benefit from more vertical, then I'll make it at the higher vertical using the protrusion that the matrix has demonstrated to be efficacious. Exactly. Just use, as you mentioned it really well, just use your clinical expertise and the type of practice and what you've learned in the phenotyping, as I said, in terms of anatomical, and uh, you can incorporate that in. In general, uh, this is my personal experience. I'd like to uh, kind of put them aside. My personal clinical, I, I don't personally practice a lot with vertical dimension uh, because I find that I help majority of people with just simply playing around with my AP. And that is, again, about 50 to 60% of all patients diagnosed, not just small to moderate. But then there are cases, as you mentioned, if everything, if I look at them, they've got a large tongue, they've got a disc that we cannot capture, uh, or, you know, everything is good, and I don't want to protrude them any further. You know, there are times that you use everything that you have. You have a big toolbox. The question is, what are the step-by-step? So we have a comment here from Stephen Millman saying that we are limited to eight by eight in Ontario. We cannot yeah. capture the airway. Yeah. Yeah. And moving along, I think we should make Mish the mayor a panelist. <laughs> <laughs> can we? Can we make? Can we make? I vote that we make Mish the mayor a panelist. <laughs> Who's with me? <laughs> <laughs> Who's with me? <laughs> I don't think I can. Can I? Let me see. I don't know. <laughs> I can't wait to meet you, Mish. She is amazing. You guys will get along. <laughs> like I should have, uh, I should have introduced you, John, to Mish. <laughs> with me. So, uh, yeah. Uh, how do you spell the last name, Elaine? Uh, the um, the mayor. D E M E Okay. Y E R. Mish. I don't see it. I don't see it here. No? D E I we're trying, Mish. Hang with us. Oh, okay. Let me see. If it allows me to. No, mm -hmm. it does not allow me to. Sorry. Okay. Never yeah. mind. I try. I try. <laughs> I try. <laughs> Okay, so here we go. You can uh, you can take even an ortho okay ortho pantomogram to see the TMJ uh, lesser radiation and to control better the vertical dimension, look to the place of the wisdom teeth to interfere. The vertical dimension is a minor factor to fail the oral plan appliance therapy. And Pablo Valiente has left us. I have to go. Thank you very much for the brilliant presentation. We hope to see you again in Belgium. Mm. Bye, Pablo. He sounds Spanish. If you could take a bite in, in, max, in max occlusion and one in max protrusion, so you can see if the vertical opening will be an issue when protruding and where you have to extract the wisdom teeth. That's uh, from Mish the mayor. And yes, yes, Mish the mayor. <laughs> that was his last uh, comment. And then that's it. That's it. Yeah. Well, listen, Shiresh, thank you so much. That was absolutely wonderful. Uh, you know, I that's have amazing. to say ninety percent of uh, the people that logged on are still here with us. Oh, uh, wait, 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 Mr. 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 Oh, Mayor so just sent another one. No yeah, problem. Yeah. Next time I will connect a panel member. Yes, uh, Mish, you'll be a panel member next okay. time. We can arrange <laughs> that. So I'd like to uh, thank you, Suresh, for spending this time with us thank and uh, really enlightening and wonderful coverage on, on the digital workflow in dental sleep medicine. Um, I have to also, uh, I, I can't host something like this without uh, also acknowledging um, the people that are on the front lines uh, yeah. working so hard while we're at home, you know, trying to flatten this curve. So honestly, I'd like to send this heartfelt thank you out to all the medical personnel, everyone 
on the front lines. And I'm going to take that even a step further. The people that throughout all this time have been at the uh, the grocery clerks, at, 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 at the cash registers, and everybody else, while we've been going through this ordeal, have been sitting there in the line of fire and whatever while we've all been safe. And so thank you to everyone that has been on the front lines in whatever capacity. And I'd like to just remind you, the Centurio Midpoint, the student stop um, event that's coming up May 12th, Don Malaysia. If you are not currently using an anterior ramp on any of your uh, oral appliances, you really should make the time to hear what Don has to say. It's very enlightening, and I think that you will actually start to consider doing that, at least selectively, if not routinely. There are some clinicians that will not put a sleep appliance in without an anterior midpoint of school and uh, stop. So um, make sure to join us that day and, and, and learn why. And I will be announcing in the next week or so uh, a few more webinars as part of this series. Thank you so much all for attending. Thank you. This is a future webinar and or join in on our dental sleep medicine speakeasy. And once again, thank you, Shiresh, man. You're the man. Thank, thank, you, so you. Much. thank you, everybody. Enjoy your weekend. Stay safe. And you as well. Thing for you to thank all those guys, frontline people. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Bye, -bye. Thank you. Bye.